topic that is given to me is role of liver in the pathogenesis of diabetes and liver as a target organ for the management of diabetes. Now, all of us know that liver has many functions. It has to do synthesis or storage of amino acids, proteins, vitamins, and fats. It has to do with detoxification, removing drug from the body. It had a circulation, a dual circulation, the portal and the systemic circulation and the bile drainage. What is very surprising, it also does a great job in the blood glucose regulation. We all know that liver is the key metabolic organ which governs the body energy metabolism. It acts the hub and connects metabolically to the skeletal muscle and the adipose tissue. And the liver energy metabolism is tightly regulated. There are many key players, for example, the nutrients, hormonals, neuronal signals, all of them regulate very tightly to maintain the blood sugar very adequately. So therefore, the blood sugar control is very vital. And therefore, Roy Taylor said that before the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, there's a long, silent scream from the liver, which few of us really bother to listen to. So this topic should be of a great interest to everybody. So let's look at the physiology of the homeostasis of glucose. We know that in the fed state, that there's a large amount of food coming in, glucose comes in, the insulin is secreted from the, from the beta cells of the pancreas, so the glycogen synthesis, there's a stopping of gluconeogenesis, and the de novo lipogenesis. And at the same time, the lipolysis stops, the glucose is driven to the fat cell, which is forms the glycerol, and stores the triglycerides in the fat cells and the glucose is transported to the muscle. And for information, 70% of the glucose is transported to the muscle, which is a very important organ for the storage. And in the fasting state, what happens is the reverse, that there's less of insulin. So there is more amount of glycogenolysis. There's more amount of gluconeogenesis. There's de novo lipogenesis reduced. And there's also lipolysis takes place, which works as a source of energy for the muscle. And that's how the muscle gets its energy from. So if you come to the tissue level in the fed state, where you have the insulin acting on the, on the liver, it activates the smile transport receptors. And this transcription factor actually acts on the DNA and therefore it inhibits the G6 space and PEPCK and therefore reduces the hepatic gluconeogenesis. And a reverse thing occurs when the glucagon sits on the, on the liver. And we know it's called a seven pass receptor. It's also called serpentine receptor because it passes seven times inside out. So it activates the protein kind pgc one alpha and that inhibits the smile trans transcription factor and pgc one alpha increases the hepatic gluconeogenesis. That's how there's an interplay between smile and pgc one alpha which regulates the glucose. Let's see what happens in patients of type 2 diabetes. We know that there's a large amount of fat, which is shown here, accumulates in the liver. And when the food is taken, the large amount of glucose, the insulin is unable to push the glucose into the tissues, namely the liver, adipose tissue, and muscle. We all know that insulin works like a policeman, which diverts the traffic and takes the glucose into these organs. But therefore, because of insulin resistance, there is a decreased glycogen synthesis, there's increased gluconeogenesis, despite the fact that the patient is just eating food, there's a de novo lipogenesis, and there's a decrease increased glucose transport to the muscle, and there is trying to put the glucose into the fat cell because of the insulin resistance, there's a still amount of lipolysis which occurs here, despite the fact that the patient has a high blood sugar. And in the fasting state, the reverse occurs, there's increased gluconeogenesis, increased glycogenolysis, there's increased lipid reestification. there's lipolysis continues, and this fat can be used as a muscle, as a source of energy. Now, if you look at the pathology, what happens in insulin resistance, let's look at the insulin sensitive tissue, especially in the normal person, when the insulin sits on the receptor, there is a post-receptor activity, which is called insulin receptor substrate. This is called signal cascade, which stimulates P13K, PI3K, which stimulates AKT1, and that reduces the glucose production, which is normal thing. In patients who are diabetic, who have got insulin resistance, there's a large amount of fat which occurs in the liver, which could be either consumption of fat, or which could decrease beta oxidation, or because of increased de novo lipogenesis by the liver. So what happens here is the insulin receptor substrate is no more activating the cascade events, 
that normally we see in patients of normal insulin sensitivity, but it stimulates the PKC and that increases the glucose production. That's exactly what happens at the molecular level or at the tissue level that happens. This is the presentation from the Lancet, which looks at the cause of these non-alcoholic fatty liver, where you see the people consume large amount of glucose, fructose, sat fat, and of course the positive energy balance, which causes increased amount of adiposity, which causes large amount of fat in the liver to stay on, it's more than 10%. There's also further inflammation because this fat is so large, it is seen by the immune system as the, as the ectopic tissue, they it bounce the inflammatory response. There's some genes which also play a role like PNP, 3A, TMG, 6, F7, and of course the gut dysbiosis. We have a next lecture on the gut. So this gut dysbiosis by the damaged associated molecular protein, or the pathogen associated molecular proteins, all of them increase the liver amount of fat, which increase fat of more than 10%, causes increased insulin resistance and causes diabetes in these patients. So therefore, the genesis of diabetes begins in the fat, in fat due to fat in the liver, and that's how the process starts. So this is a very interesting article which came in um, in the, uh, the Hepatology Journal, which looks at liver and diabetes, a vicious circle, where what it says is that there is an infection because of the impaired activity of toll-like receptors. And therefore the mucus is very thin and you have got invasion by the bacteria, which changes the immune response. There's a chronic inflammatory phase and that brings about increased amount of cardiovascular disease, diabetes and obesity because of the increased appetite these patients have. So therefore, is metabolic syndrome and infectious disease in humans. This is a gut liver axis. There's a study done in the rat, in the rats it has proven convincingly that the infection because of the impaired activity of toll-like receptor is responsible for the, the NASH or the increasing permeability because of the bacterial overgrowth. We have a very simple test, which is called ALT or HGPT. And this is a study which looked, which looked at the health insurance program in Korea, which has more than 142,000 patients of population, which between 35 to 59 years, and what they looked at the ALT from 90 to 92, and they followed up till 2000, and the death certificate was used as a criteria to determine the survival and the cause of death. And you know, the people of men have a normal HTPT of 30 or below 30, and women below 90. You see that 30 to 39, which is a normal level of HGPT in men, we have about 9.5% increased risk of mortality because of liver disease, and all cause mortality by 1.74. And if you look at here, when it's 100, we have almost 59% mortality because of liver disease. So it becomes a very simple, easy, and cheap method of identifying the patients who are at risk of developing liver disease in future. This is a meta-analysis which looked at the NAFLD and the incident risk of diabetes. This is a follow-up for five years published in Diabetes Care. We know that the odds ratio for developing diabetes with NAFLD is about 2.6. That is most threefold risk of developing diabetes, which is a concomitant cause of cardiovascular disease or NAFLD itself can cause cardiovascular disease. And there's a 64% increased risk of developing cardiovascular disease or a hepatocellular carcinoma. So this is called as a bidirectional association between the fatty liver and type two diabetes. This is the very famous hypothesis by Roy Taylor, who talks about twin cycle hypothesis, which is an excess calorie balance, where the people indulge in, in, the, in, the, in eating excess food, where the liver gets saturated with excess amount of fat, which develops insulin resistance to the, in the liver because of the high fat content, which already said, which makes the insulin to draw more insulin, so increasing the amount of plasma insulin from, this, from the pancreas, which causes to interact with the increased plasma glucose. And the VLDL also enters the beta cells of the pancreas and causes increased islet fat, which is a lipotoxicity. And that brings about acute decreased response of insulin secretion, eventually again elevating the plasma glucose. So there's a twin hit hypothesis which works at both at the liver and at the pancreas, where it ultimately results into formation of the diabetes. And this is again, talks about 
the insulin resistance as the main cause for the progression of a disease in the liver and eventually developing type 2 diabetes. We know that because of hyperinsulinemia, there's upregulation of sterol, regulated element binding protein, or a carbohydrate related element binding protein that causes the increased amount of fat in liver, which is again contributed by the environmental factors of sedentary lifestyle and dietary factors of consumption of excess amount of fructose, the genetic predisposition by the PNPA3, and which ultimately reduces the fatty liver and the NASH. And we know that the hepatitis diabetes is again a primary disease of the liver, which can cause the problems in, 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 in liver, which can result in diabetes. We know that about 80% of the patients with a chronic liver disease have diabetes, and they do not have standard risk factors like high BMI or a family history of diabetes or dyslipidemia. The common cause being the hepatitis C virus, the alcohol liver disease, or a cryptogenic etiology, which is responsible for the problems of the diabetes in patients who develop cirrhosis. And this worsens as the it worsens the liver disease and is associated with increased liver complication like encephalopathy, variceal bleeding, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, and hepatorenal syndrome. We know that because of the decreased hepatic extraction, there is a hyperinsulinemia, which causes insulin resistance. And we know that because of the, because of the autoimmune damage, the beta cells, we also have a direct beta cell injury direct beta cell injury by the iron deposition in hemochromatosis and the fatty infiltration in the beta cells can cause the pancreatic beta cell dysfunction. So these patients who have a primary liver disease can also manifest as diabetes, which is called as a hepatogenous diabetes. So therefore fat in liver is bad. We know that it can cause diabetes. It can cause fatty liver disease. It can cause dyslipidemia, hypertension, and eventually heart disease. So we know that the NAFLD is the core factor for a diabetes development, a risk of cardiovascular disease, hypertension, atherosclerosis, chronic kidney disease, PCOS, sleep apnea, osteoporosis, cancers. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, it can cause elevated level of the ALT. So the main targets coming to therapy for type, type 2 diabetes management is usually the pancreas and the skeletal muscle for the improvement of the beta cell function. We, attack the adipose tissue to reduce obesity and hypotoxicity. Gut, of course, is very really important because the incredible hormones come from the gut and the kidney, heart, endothelium, brain, and the eye are protected by treating the patients with the, with adequately in, in diabetes. And the liver is often not included among the target organs, although it's well established that the hepatic insulin resistance is responsible for fasting hyperglycemia and contributes to glucose intolerance. And therefore, the high prevalence of NAFLD, NASH, and type 2 diabetes made the liver a central target for drug development. And this is the hepatic effects of various drugs. We can say that the drugs can be classified, those who have direct action on the liver, and those who have indirect action on the liver. And therefore, we have drugs which have like insulin, like FXR, agonist, G, protein, G kinase, glucose kinase activators, then we have anti-inflammatory drugs like vitamin E, anti-fibrotic like, uh, drugs we have, then we have elixir agonist, we have metformin, we have PTB1 inhibitors, we have glucagon receptor inhibitors, we have MPCs and of course PPAR, alpha, beta, alpha, gamma and delta. All these are available. We know that the pharmacological drugs we have, the GLP receptor agonist, GIP, GLP, increases the insulin secretion, and the SGLT2 inhibitors will decrease the insulin secretion. So this is the various places where you can attack the patient with the liver disease. For example, lifestyle modification, improve the insulin resistance, improve the disposal of the fat from the liver, reduce the inflammation and antifibrotic therapy. Of course, we all know lifestyle modification forms the key concept for almost all disease, including diabetes and all the all the uh, non-communicable diseases. We have the diet, of course, very important. The calorie restriction plays a very major role. Weight loss from seven to 10% does improve uh, as much as any other drug. And exercise has been very important. Both aerobic exercise and anaerobic exercises, both are important. The bariatric surgery reduces liver fat and also improves the histologic process in the NASH, including fibrosis and 
individualize the dimensions of the decision for cirrhosis. Then we have the drug therapy like vitamin E, which is recommended for non-alcoholic hepatitis as for the ASLD 2018. The Asia Pacific guidelines says insufficient evidence for using vitamin E. Pyridol also is recommended only in patients of type 2 diabetes proven, biopsy proven NASH. The metformin is not recommended by any of these guidelines. Okay. The statin, of course, can be used in patients with dyslipidemia. It reduces the cardiovascular mortality and can be used in patients who have a dyslipidemia. Urka, of course, no recommendation, not mentioned. Omega-3 fatty acids, not mentioned. Obitacolic acid, there's late data, though it's available today in India, but there's no further data available. DL2 receptor agonist, further data needed. It does improve the fibrosis as per the APC, this 2020 guideline. And SGLT2 inhibitor also, they said, for the data is necessary. This is the data looks at vitamin E, which shows that there is a transplant free survival quite significantly more when you use vitamin E in these patients. And the hepatic decompensation is also better when you use vitamin E in these patients. These patients have followed up for a period of 10 years. These randomized placebo controlled double blind trial with pyogenitazone in 101 patients with the 45 milligram dose of pyogenitazone, mind you, 45 milligram which shows the improvement in the two-point reduction of NASH, emission of NASH, and one-point improvement in fibrosis, though the significant data is on two-point reduction in the, uh, in the NASH and with no worsening of fibrosis. The GL preceptor agonists have been very, very interesting molecules because they bring a lot of weight loss, and we have sustained three, sustained seven, sustained 10 studies respectively, telling us that the weight loss can be as high as about 6.5 kilograms in these patients when they're compared with exonotide, this again, uh, BID molecule. And that's also very interesting is we have seen that pentraxin 3, which is a biomarker for the heart failure or heart disease in patients of diabetes, also has been shown to be reduced when you use the l receptor agonist. The SGLT2 inhibitors are again very interesting molecules. The new kid on the block, there are seven studies which looked at these patients, totally 498 and four looked at the liver enzymes, four looked at the liver fat, and two looked at the fibrosis biomarkers. They are none related to high quality, only one as a moderate quality. The five systematic reviews indicate that the HGLT inhibitors decrease liver fat content, and one small single arm histological study showed improvement in steatosis. There is no evidence of reduction in fibrosis. And this is the study which again says that the, it does change the histological picture in patients of NAFLD. So this drug today is quite promising. Of course, furthermore data is needed. This is the data from the, the hepatology communication 2021, which says this drug could be a very promising. Obitacolic acid is the only drug today available, which is the antifibrotic drug. And this is the Flynn study, which says the total group showed improvement in 35%. The F1 also showed 35%. F2, F3 showed 42%. The only problem was the intense pruritus and high levels of LDL in these patients. So to approach the patient's currently available treatment today, we have weight loss, either by lifestyle modification or by the bariatric surgery, treat type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular risk factors by hyperglycemia, hypertension, dyslipidemia. We have liver-directed treatment like vitamin E and pyoglitazone and other approaches like statin and metformin. Where does it all lead to? I think all of us know these guidelines we have been well familiar with, but these guidelines need to be modified. Yes, it does. We need to have this extra column with the modifying treatment which patient has NAFLD. And what modification necessary? Can I think of SGLT2, GLP receptor agonist, and glitazone are the drugs which can be preferred in these patients with NAFLD. Why is this so important? Because there are 12.1 million patients in India which accounts to 17% of the diabetic population, which have the high event of fibrosis and liver-related disease and cardiovascular mortality and morbidity. So these patients needs to be addressed. So that we need to create or need to modify the existing guidelines to accommodate these patients of NAFLD. Coexisting diabetes in NAFLD has increased risk of developing cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma, which is a very important risk factor. So we need to pay attention to that. We also need to know that type 2 diabetes is strongly associated with card cardiovascular disease and presence of NAFLD increase the risk comfort and con considerably. So therefore, these are three reasons why we must include in the guidelines 
whether the patient has pre-existing NAFND. If so, then that has to be addressed. And with that, I can conclude my talk. Thank you very much for the patient listening. Any questions, I'll be too happy to answer. Over to you, Dr. Loke.